All right, so what is wholesaling? Uh, wholesaling is the idea of putting either one, a distressed home under contract with the intent to sign that contract to a buyer, AKA our funding partners. And the investor assigns the home to potential buyers for a higher price than we have a property under contract for. So simple math, if a house is worth $100,000 ARV and we're able to get that house under contract for $40,000 um, and you know we're buying an as is condition. So that means, um, you know, the condition it's currently in, uh, it may need a couple of repairs. It just may not be up to what the market 2020 standards look like for a home that you'll see on the MLS. So we'll buy for $40,000. We'll go and assign that particular contract to an end investor for either fifty dollars or $60,000. We'll package it up and say, hey, we have a deal for sale for $60,000. It may take X amount of repairs to put into it and you can sell it for $100,000 on the end. So that leaves us to make a 10K profit in between and the investor can make his spread on the back end once he actually sells the home on the MLS. So here is pretty much our six step process to um, how we, you know, um, wholesale properties, you know, from A to Z. Um, so step one, um, we find a distressed property to wholesale. Um, typically, our number one method is via cold calling. Um, we do other forms of marketing, but that's our main form of marketing. Um, step two. Um, we make an offer um, right over the phone um, to most home sellers, uh, to most homeowners. Um, and that's typically based on, you know, looking at comparable properties and some formulas that we have. So after we make that offer and we uh, get that property under contract, step three is we assess the property's rehab and renovation costs. Um, so we do majority of the deals virtually, you know, without ever going to see these properties. So a lot of the properties that we get, we end up getting them under contract sight unseen. And then after we get it under contract, we then have someone go out to the properties and then we kind of see how much work does this property have? That way we can see, you know, what we can really sell it for. Step four, um, kind of hand in hand with step, you know, right after we get the contract, but we go ahead and open escrow. We send this contract to a title company. We send over our earnest money um, and they go ahead and start the title search process while we move on to step five. Uh, we start marketing these properties out via, you know, different text messages and emails, uh, email blasts, maybe different social media sites like Facebook and things like that. And we end up finding a, a, a buyer that actually wants to buy this property and put the work into it. And then step six, um, title company just prepares the title and we go ahead and close on these deals. Um, this typically takes us, you know, anywhere between 14 to 21 days or so on average. All right. So. Pre foreclosure is the lead we go after. You know, that's where homeowner falls behind on the payment. And uh, the bank is about to take that house to auction. So our goal is to get the house before it goes to auction. And we typically have anywhere from 30 to 90 days once, once that notice of default has been sent to the homeowner. Um, another lead source we go after is probates. Uh, it's when a person passes away and the house goes over to a next of kin, depending on if there was a will or not. And we try to get these houses under contract while they're in the probate um, time frame. And a good thing about probate is that sometimes these deals take a little longer to pass because probate can be a really lengthy process, but um, they tend to yield some pretty good spreads on the back end because you have people who, you know, they may have inherited a house and they may live in Oklahoma and the house is Texas and they don't want anything to do with it. They don't want to pay the taxes on it. They don't want to have to worry about putting a renter in it. So that's where we come in and buy the house and be that optimal solution for that homeowner. And then absentee owners, you know, kind of self-explanatory, but these are owners who either have one abandoned their houses or they have rent houses, vacation homes. Um, you know, a lot of things fall into this particular lead source, but, um, what we're looking for out of absentee owners is vacant homes. These are our bread and butter leads because these homeowners tend to be the most motivated to sell, especially in times right now, right? To where rents are being frozen all across the country. So you'll, if a homeowner has a vacant home and he knows that he can't put a rent in it, a, a renter in it because, um, you know, they may not, they may not have the funds to pay the rent on a consistent basis due to a lot of people losing their jobs right now. Um, bacon homes, again, kind of our bread and butter we like to go after and save a home for having to go through that situation. So code violations. So for us, these are pretty much when a property is vacant um, and a homeowner has abandoned this property and they are fined for different code, viola code violations, such as having high grass, having trash on the property, 
um, you know, the city will come around and typically place, uh, I know here in that, the DFW area, they'll come around and place like an orange sticker on the window of the property. Um, so these are public records. So we pull that information because it's, ten, you know, it tends to be a telltale sign that, you know, that nobody lives in that home. And again, we're looking for these vacant properties. Um, another lead form that we kind of add in our code violations is not necessarily a code violation, but um, our inactive water and uh, no electricity. Um, and these are essentially just people who have had their water shut off in their house for six months or they've had the electricity shut off in their house for six months. Um, and again, that's public records. Right. Um, and we all know nobody can live with no water for six months at a time. Um, so, again, that's a telltale sign that that property is probably vacant. Um, another lead we go after are our tax delinquents. Um, this is pretty much when a homeowner fails to pay their property taxes. They fall into a tax delinquent situation um, and a property tax lien is filed against that property, um, which pretty much is going to prohibit that property from being sold or refinanced. Um, so in times like this, you know, sellers are, you know, in need of a cash offer because we've seen tax liens range, you know, all the way up to 50, 60, $80,000. And most Americans don't have that type of money. And the only type of asset that they have worth that amount of money is their home. So we come in and provide a solution where we can buy that property cash. They can pay that tax lien off, move on to bigger and better things, um, and get that behind them. And another uh, couple of leads we go after are evictions and divorces. So pretty much when a tenant, you know, a tenant's behind on rent, um, you know, and they're evicted um, and, you know, life happens, you know, love sometimes is split and people do divorce. And when divorce happens, properties tend uh, to need to be sold. Um, so those are just a few of the different lead types that we go after. All right. So uh, four ways we can serve. We actually uh, bit this one, but this is something that we like to send homeowners to let them know that maybe a cash, if a cash offer doesn't necessarily work for that particular scenario, either one, a homeowner owes too much on it. Uh, we like to give them four different options that they can go with. So cash offer is obviously the first one that we try to go at them with. If not, uh, depending on the balance, if they have a balance on the note, we either go with a lease option or an owner finance situation. And then if none of those work and they just want to put the house on the market to recoup the most from their asset, then we'll tell them to go ahead and list it with one of our preferred realtors that we have in-house. So, um, again, just uh, uh, as a company, we try to be the one to have the most solutions for their issue. So this sheet just kind of helps them lay it out to be like, hey, reading through all four of these, which one do you think best would help you? And then we move forward with that step. All right. So uh, the big question, what formal education does this take, uh, i.e. real estate license or a college degree, any of that? So the thing is, it doesn't take none at all. The only thing that we have seen that's helped us excel these past two years has been our grit, confidence, hard work, persistence, patience. And then the big one, graduating from YouTube University. You know, between Mike and I, we probably have over hundreds of hours of just watching YouTube videos of how does this work? And then, you know, also calling on friends who are also in the business, but um, you know, it just takes a, a really strong mindset um, to be able to have all these and do it consistently because in this business, you know, we hear a lot of no's that's going to be the majority of your makeup is hearing no, 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 no. So um, eventually learning how to fall in love with the word no, because you know, it's going to lead to a yes has really helped us over these past two years get to the point to where we are. So leverage of resources. These are just a few books um, that we, you know, recommend that, you know, Armani and myself have both read that we think are just, you know, tremendous. Um, the first one is Emotional Intelligence um, by G, uh, Gene Grease and uh, Travis Bat Bradbury. Um, the next one, Crucial Conversations uh, by Al Switzler, Joseph Greeny and uh, Ron Mc McMillan. Uh, the, uh, the next one, um, one of my favorites um, that we've read is uh, Never Split the Difference is an awesome negotiation book, just really breaking down the art of negotiation by Chris Voss and uh, Tal Raz. Um, and another book that, you know, some of us have may have read, but I, I know a lot of people have heard of is Rich Dad, Poor Dad um, by Robert Kiyosaki. I think that's probably the first um, financial book that I've probably read that opened my eyes up um, to want something a little different. Um, and the next book um, is Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill, um, probably my all time favorite book. Um, and The Go-Giver as well um, is an awesome book um, just about, you know, giving, you know, priding yourself on being of value by Bob Bird. 
Um, so those are just a couple of books that we like to throw out um, that we recommend people read. 